He was an incredible, talented musician. I, I've not ever met anyone who's worked harder. Quite obsessive in a way, but... Really? Um, and, I mean, Ian and I have spent many a night in here drinking Harvey's, um, and I'm surprised they didn't go out of business when Ian moved, actually. <laughs> Well, obviously, Ian, as we all know, didn't suffer fools gladly, and um, for that I love him. There's a lot of superficiality about him, Ian wasn't part of that, and, uh, and he brought his sense of humour, cutting and killing, slicing sense of humour to every encounter um, that one ever had with him and that he had with anyone, whether it was text or Facebook or person to person. Beautiful guy. Yeah. So yeah, that was it. Really, at his core, he was a he was a beautiful guy. So what can you say about that? There's nothing else to say. No. You know, and it was also on top of that, he's a fantastic saxophone player. Yeah. World a world class saxophone player. Yeah. Yeah, he was a hell of a musician, as uh, we all know, and uh, he was a very diligent, hardworking guy. He worked at his craft and. Uh, he was uh, very unassuming and um, self-effacing and a uh, funny guy, but actually behind that there was a very serious, uh, focused musician who, who became a very great musician in his time. And, like, but no, it was just like, I mean, like, who teaches himself like, to get to that level? He told me that he taught himself. I think he won lesson off some Joe Lovano or something like that, some amazing saxophone player. Okay. You know, I think he won, like, as far as I know, you know, maybe, I mean, but yeah. Okay. I, pretty, pretty astonishing. I mean, I kind of jumped my jaw hit the floor when he said that, that he taught himself to get to that level. And so when he, yeah, he told me that, and I just went, so no shit. <laughs> Great guy, always had fun, always <laughs> made me laugh. You know, it's great. The thing about Ian is he was just like a joke and minute guy. You know what I mean? It's like you're never not laughing. You know, and like that sometimes made you so relaxed when you played music together because although this amazing music was pouring out of him, at the end of every tune there'd be something else. Any anybody less humble than him, with that amount of talent, um, would have made for worse music than we made. And he he really managed to make us all feel like we were doing something quite special. Yeah, you know, so many memories. It's impossible to pick one really. But just just a lot of fun, a lot of laughs, uh, some wonderful gigs. Yeah. You know? um, so all I can say really, you know, a bit of jazz torture along the way, like yeah, we all yeah. do it. Uh, Man, I spent as much time propping up the bar with Ian as I did playing on a stage. It was, we had a hell of a lot of fun together, like many, many, many hours of fun. It was quite, it was, yeah. He was, he was a great guy to be around, you know, he's, even when he was miserable and pissed off, he was still hysterically funny about it, you know, and he always made, made everything light, you know, and very witty and clever guy too. But he's left a great legacy and uh, inspired a lot of people. Yeah, and it's a massive crowd. You can see how many people, and, and he'd be, I know Ian would be absolutely astonished. He would be absolutely astonished. But he's a very humble guy. Yeah. Very humble guy. But what, I, um, what, I, what I'm expecting now is Ian to walk in any moment. I know a lot of us are having a lot of problems coming to terms with the fact that he's not here anymore. And um, so obviously um, that's part of his character that he would just bloody well walk in right now. So, so nothing had happened. Um, but I think my, my abiding admiration for Ian is about his creativity and his strength as a creative force and um, how creativity requires a lot of hard work and uh, a lot of commitment and attention to detail and he had those qualities and I love him dearly and so I will miss him very much.
Thank you all for coming here to the Bright Elm Centre today to celebrate the life of Ian Price. Uh, my name's Ali, and I'm Ian's older brother. Um, before I start, I'd like to make a bit of a confession. I'm not actually a jazz fan. Um, <laughs> Uh, if Ian and I ever discussed musical tastes, I used to give him a bit of a hard time. Uh, it was always friendly banter, and always returned, uh, he always returned the sentiments. So if anything comes across as a bit rude, it's, it's not intended. Um, don't take it personally, it's completely directed towards him. <laughs> so on behalf of his family, I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of the wonderful comments that have been left on Ian's Facebook page. I'd also like to thank everyone who attended the gig at the verdict and generously donated towards Ian's treatment. I was back home in Warwickshire, so unfortunately I wasn't able to attend, but Mum, Claire and Jill got down there, and they said it was truly amazing. The memories, stories, photographs, and the kind comments you've given us so much strength have told us a lot about the Ian you know. So in return, I'd like to tell you about the Ian that we knew before he came down to Brighton in the 90s. Uh, we grew up in a musical family, but while for the rest of us it was simply a passion, Ian decided it would be his life. So while I put on a tie and started to work in an office, Ian headed off to Brighton to become a full-time musician. I'd like to think that one day he'd have played saxophone at my funeral, so in a fitting tribute to him, I thought I'd do a PowerPoint presentation at his. <laughs> <laughs> I think he would have wanted that. Uh, now, before I start, I'd like to point out that this is meant to be an informative view of Ian's life, with a few jokes thrown in here and there to brighten things up a bit. I pulled together some photographs and a bit of a narrative, uh, and I took to Google to get a bit of inspiration. I typed in jazz and fun. <laughs> <laughs> so you can appreciate I had my work cut out. Um, so what I've done then is to pick out a few memories and key events with photographic evidence. And if you will humour me, I will take you through them in chronological order. Some of the photographs I uncovered are not really suitable for a large audience, so I've included those as well. <laughs> so, Ian William Price was born on the 2nd of July 1969 to his loving parents, Ron and Mita, in the Shrewsbury Hospital in Shropshire. Or as I think you Brightonians call it, up north. <laughs> Um, he came back to Whitchurch to complete the family of Jill, Ali, Andrew and Claire. Now we were lucky that as children Ron was pretty handy with the camera, although I haven't managed to locate any pictures of Ian as a baby. Um, but here's one of the early ones. Now you can play a bit of odd one out here. As you can see, Ian was a little different from all of us. <laughs> and we were all born between the 11th and 25th of March, that's all six of us. Except Ian, who was born on the 2nd of July. <laughs> He had a shock of blonde hair, compared to our brown hair, um, and he was slightly shorter than the rest of us. <laughs> well, I think to be fair to him, he was only five when that was taken. Um, and he was the only one in the entire family to have eczema. No, he did. Um, but despite all these shortcomings, there was no brotherly rivalry. rivalry. Um, I can't play the saxophone, but then I don't suppose you can do a PowerPoint presentation. So, uh, <laughs> different skills. Now, I've heard Ian called a few names, um, which isn't a very big town, so we all went to the same schools, and at school he picked up a nickname that was first given to me when I was 10, which was Bean, and when Andrew started at senior school, he was called uh, Little Bean, and then, of course, when Ian got there in 1980s, he was called Baby Bean. <laughs> but he preferred the name, I don't know whether anybody knew he was Baby Bean, whether that one came down to Brighton with him or kept that one quiet. Um, when, uh, but he preferred his name to be Pricey, and uh, he was even known to the Wichita Rugby Club as Spider-Man, or Spidey, after I took him there and he did that thing with his wrists at the age of nine. There we go. Now, we always had musical instruments in the house, and everyone can play an instrument of one sort or another. Uh, but Ian was more than, for Ian, it was more than just a passing interest. He once asked me why a bass had four strings. I said, I don't know why has a bass guitar got four strings. And he said, in case one breaks. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies to uh, old bass players. Um, but if Ian had a diff uh, an interest in jazz, he kept it very quiet. Uh, he was more into pop and rock, and even <coughs> punk. And he got a job with Prince's TV Repairs, and he saved up enough money to buy a black Fender Stratocaster and a Fender amp, and he started to play. And he played, and he played, and he played. 
Um, now, I know, Mum, you mentioned before about the, the butchers, and I thought I'd try and sneak that one in there, because you also got a job of, of um, a junior in the butchers. And every night, you'd come home, and there'd be a pig's tail or something in a drawer, <laughs> or an eyeball or something <laughs> in a pocket. And uh, we were quite glad when he got a job working for the TV repairs. <laughs> Um, now, with the guitar, he, he bought a copy of Guitar and Son by um, Pete Haycock from the Climax Blues Band. And he learned to play it note perfect. And I know that music note perfect also because he played it and he played it. And anybody that knows Ian and his commitment to music um, knows that he practices and practices until he gets it perfect. Uh, then he got together with a group of friends and formed a band called Opera. And he asked me to play, on account of my flair and diversity on the keyboards, um, and also because I had a, a driving licence <laughs> for my dad's purple maxi, which uh, got him to gigs. Uh, our set included Sultans of Swing, Bat Out of Hell, and Jump by Van Halen. <laughs> so, um, but he had one rule, and he stuck to it no matter what, and there was no status quo. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I'm surprised how many people know what they are. Uh, it was around 1984 and Ian was still at school and I can remember getting a frantic knock at the door one afternoon and I opened it to find my sister Claire and she said, you better come quickly. Ian's been taken to hospital. She told me that he'd taken some magic mushrooms from the rugby pitch next to the school and that I'd been taken ill in class. I asked her how many Ian had taken and she said he'd eaten four to five raw mushrooms. Now, I've dabbled a bit with mushrooms, and I told her not to worry because four or five mushrooms aren't really going to do much harm, and the school was probably being cautious. And she said, I didn't say four to five, I said 45. So we're trying to apply that uh, And I headed off to the hospital to see him. Well, you know how he pulls funny faces. Right? The best face I've ever seen Ian pull was when I walked into the ward to find him tucked up in bed with just his head sticking out above the covers, high as a kite and surrounded by several elderly people with very disapproving looks on their faces. The matron told me that he hadn't stopped laughing since he'd arrived because, as he put it, everybody had enormous heads. He was, he was kept in overnight and discharged with a pamphlet uh, about not doing drugs or something. Um, well, he left school at the age of 16 and he bought himself a Pooch Grand Prix moped and he became a biker. Then he got <coughs> into punk. You see the studded belt there? He was into punk. Uh, and I also have it on good authority, as Claire, that he got into the Bay City Rollers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, I haven't got any proof of that, so <laughs> but I had to throw it in. Um, I guess you'd call this finding yourself. Um, back to the motorbike. Uh, one day, Ian and I were on the drive of our house in which the police car pulled up. Uh, the policeman walked over and he said, Are you Ian Price? Ian said, yeah. And he said, I need you to come down the station um, because we believe you're a witness to um, a traffic incident. Um, Involving his friend, he told me, it was, his friend was riding a moped and the pair of them he, this lad crossed the road and uh, veered in front of another car. So um, they asked him to come down and make a voluntary statement that would only be used if the matter went to court and he agreed. And I was supposed to go there as a responsible adult. That's a responsible adult who knows about magic, magic mushrooms. Yeah. Um, so when I asked him what it was about, he said he'd been having a race and they'd... Uh, gone round the left-hander at the top of the road and his mate was trying to keep up and drifted onto the wrong side. Uh, so I took him into the station in my dad's maxi and um, before we went in, I gave him a little bit of advice. I said, now, I reckon this copper is going to try and catch you out. I reckon he might try to get you to admit you're racing. On no account, admit you're racing. Whatever he says, and if he pushes you on it, um, I'll step in and we'll call it off. It is voluntary. So... He went in, and I remember it well, we all sat around a little table, the policeman <coughs> took us to the interview room and sat us down. He explained what the interview was about, and he read out a caution. Uh, and then he said, so in your own words, would you like to explain what happened? Now, he was a bit nervous, and he gathered his thoughts, and he said in a clear, confident voice, well, me and my mate were having a race. <laughs> <laughs> well, I coughed, the policeman coughed, 
And he beat me to it. The policeman said, I'm sorry I was distracted and didn't hear that. Would you mind starting? <laughs> Well, it was 1986, something happened that would change his life forever. He discovered jazz mags. <laughs> now I'm glad that got a laugh, because where, <laughs> where I come from, if you read jazz mags, your mum will tie your hands behind your back. <laughs> I wasn't sure that was going to go. I downloaded a copy of a jazz mag and it was full of music. And, uh, so, <laughs> his parents lent him the money to buy a saxophone and he started teaching himself to play. He did exactly the same as he did with his guitar, and he played and played and played, day and night, non-stop, and got better and better, and he started to build up a network of likewise colleagues. Now, there's a very interesting interview with Ian in the Sussex Jazz Mag that describes his transition into jazz, and he formed a band called Life After Work uh, with his good friend Julian Bendel, and shortly after, another band called Colour or Sex. And he had a big write-up in a local paper and was horrified to see that they'd misheard the name of the band. <laughs> now, I don't know whether that was his fault or a typo, but that's not the way to start your career with a, with a band. Um, so we started to build our own careers, and we left the family home one by one. And although we kept in touch, we focused on our own lives, and he went off to do his thing. We worked, he worked hard at his job and invested time and effort. A bit like an endowment, of course, the difference between a jazz musician and an endowment is that if you wait long enough, an endowment will eventually mature and make some money. <laughs> now, I did find that, you had no idea how difficult it was to get that one in. <laughs> there we are. And then, all of a sudden, he was gone. He had a son, Harvey. Hey. Um, and I saw him on the Wogan show as well with John Camp and, and Roy Wood. And we also saw him on the big breakfast. I don't know if anyone's seen that. <laughs> they were doing something about new musicians in Brighton. <laughs> weird lot you are, really. <laughs> and uh, we had that one recorded, and I've, uh, I've got the video of that one. Um, and every now and again, we'd meet at a wedding, and he'd be playing in the area, or, um, and he'd call in to see me. Um, and although we were miles apart, we'd talk three or four times a year, and one of the last times I met up with him before his illness was when he played with the wonderful Terry Seabrook's Milestones in Warwick in 2010. After the show, he asked me how it went, and true to form, I was quite critical. <laughs> um, I told him that the problem with jazz was that there was no lyrics, no verses, no chorus, and no story. <laughs> uh, I'll always remember his reply, word for word, almost as if he'd rehearsed it. <laughs> He said, piss off. <laughs> um, he would often sign off our telephone call with some such insult, but not before telling a joke. And this was the last one he told me in June this year. A drummer was fed up with getting ribbed by the other band members about not being a proper musician, so he decided to learn the guitar. He did some research, and once he decided what he needed, he walked into the shop and said to the young man, I would like to buy two guitars, I'd like a six-string acoustic with a cutaway, and I would like a six-string acoustic with a single coil pickups and a tremolo. And the young man said, are you a drummer by any chance? <laughs> the drummer, thinking he'd been recognised, said, yes, how did you know? He said, because this is a chip shop. <laughs> <laughs> it's an old one, but it was funny when he told me that. I am truly amazed at the number of people that, that um, turned up here today. I didn't know that many people like jazz, but... Um, <laughs> Please, don't let me down there. Okay, well I certainly all remember, always remember Ian for his jokes. And also for having no blocking mechanism for all those wholly inappropriate comments, which is a trait we both share. Um, for the faces he pulled, and of course the catalogue poses, um, for his complete inability to look at a video camera without becoming a roving reporter. <laughs> and got that from his dad. And his complete devotion to his music. But above everything, he'll always be a father, a son, and our kid brother. And we'll never forget him. Rest in peace, Ian. Thank you.
Kelly here. Uh, the next speaker is uh, one of Ian's closest musical associates over many, many years. And uh, I know uh, Ian had a very high opinion of Terry Seabrook. Oh, yeah. Well, it's great to see all these people here today. The words on everyone's lips, can't believe it. So many people have heard say that. For many of us, it seems like it was only yesterday when we were doing gigs with Ian, and then suddenly he'd been snatched away from us. And yet, of course, in many ways, Ian hasn't departed. He's, he's so much a part of us in our lives. His music, his funny, enthusiastic, loving, and very honest personality. He will always be with us, especially today. There's been a huge expression and outpouring of love for Ian over the last few weeks. No one knew he had so many friends. In fact, his sister Claire told me that, who looked after him so marvellously in the last few weeks of his life, said that he, she didn't think Ian knew he had so many friends. <laughs> now, Ian was a long-time member of two of my musical projects, Kubana Bob, Milestones, and we travelled around the country to gigs over 16 years, so we had the opportunity to get to know each other extremely well and form a deep friendship. Our conversations on car journeys covered all sorts of things, life, religion, science, music, as well as a lot of looning around. Ian's obsession with practice was famous. After a long drive, arriving back to Brighton at two or three in the morning, I would drop Ian off at his studio, I'd go home to bed, but he'd be off to spend the rest of the night practicing. And he was very gleeful about it, he'd be rubbing his hands saying, yes, going to get some practice in. <laughs> Never called Ian before two in the afternoon. <laughs> that made planning gigs a little bit hard. Ian had a great enthusiasm for and a commitment to music. At one period in Kubana Bop, he, he actually memorised the entire set. And it was quite, quite an involved set pad of music. He memorised it and played the pad without music, and after that I decided I'll to try and do the same, but it wasn't an easy task. <laughs> and he only depped out three gigs in 14 years, so he's a very committed member of the band. He was more or less self-taught when it came to the saxophone, but he learned to play many other instruments. As we know, he started out on piano and singing as a choir boy, and I know that was very important formative musical experiences for him. I never heard him play piano, which is odd, because he recently told me that he thought, for him, piano was the instrument. But I never heard him actually sit down and play one. He also played violin, guitar, drums, percussion, flute, clarinet, bass clarinet, and oh yes, the saxophone. <laughs> Mainly tenor, but also alto and soprano. I never heard him play baritone, but I'm sure he could, because as Alan Barnes says, the baritone, he just played the same old nonsense on the, as on the alto, but it comes out an octave lower. <laughs> Ian had a great thirst for learning and seemed to find time for new things all the time. I, I knew him for his love of Latin music and contemporary jazz, but he played in lots of groups in different styles. I can't mention them all, but I know in the last few years he particularly developed a love for playing gypsy jazz and made many new friends. And he recently joined a classical saxophone quartet. I also found out that he was working his way through the novels of Charles Dickens. <laughs> On April the 16th this year, Ian came to sit in on a gig at the Nelson, where we started from. And uh, a gig, I think, was with Imogen Ryle and uh, Nigel Thomas, and I was playing. And although his main instrument is tenor sax, he brought along his new alto saxophone, which he just bought with a recent inheritance. He'd been practicing day and night, as usual, and sounded so good that at the end of the gig, I said to him, bloody hell, Ian, that's your instrument. And although I'd heard him play alto a lot, he sounded phenomenal on this new one even though, at this point, he was in a lot of pain. The last gig I did with him, though, was at the Ancient Mariner in Hove with Nigel Thomas on the May the 22nd, when he played soprano sax for the whole gig, because he wasn't able to support the tenor sax with his back at this point. But he sounded beautiful. Another thing about Ian was that he was really supportive in everything we did together. And he reassured me when I had doubts, as I did on the Milestones project, when I was writing a, a live film score for a Buster Keaton film. I had doubts as to whether it was a completely mad idea or not, but Ian constantly reassured me and we managed to complete it. In many ways, I feel like we were a musical team, 
a, a set salt thing counts for a lot in this business. A sort of chasnade, if you like, or hinge and bracket. <laughs> <laughs> Ian and I play with many great musicians, and he loved most of them. Many, one who he particularly clicked with was Alan Barnes. Now, I have a gig here. I, I, sorry, I have a picture. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it's not on the uh, screen. It's a picture of a gig that uh, I think was the first one that Alan did. I haven't showed this to Alan yet. Alan did with Ian. Uh, it's me on piano, Paul Whitten on bass, and Tristan Banks on the drums. We had a gig at the Wellington in Shoreham that ran for a, a few months, and uh, Ian, Ian was uh, playing that night. And Alan was in town um, in his new role as the tutor on rock school. And uh, I invited him to come down and sit in, and we had a great time. For the first piece, they decided to play Cherokee at something like 5,000 beats per minute, <laughs> which is very fast. And I remember in the break, Tristan saying to me, the drummer, saying to me something like, well, that's what happens when two great sax players meet for the first time. There's no easing in, is there? <laughs> so anyway, I got a few ideas, and uh, a year later, we put milestones together, featuring uh, Graham Flowers and trumpet, Alan Barnes and Ian Price, Spike Wells and Paul Whitten. When I visited Ian Hospital, Ian in hospital, the day after he'd been told that he didn't have long, he was remarkably positive and brave. And I know everyone found this. He had no regrets, he said. He'd had a great life, fairly hedonistic, and he'd done and achieved many of the things he wanted to. He still had plans to get well and to record an album, but sadly, that opportunity was not to come. So Ian has left a huge gap in my musical life, in all our musical lives, and a huge space as a friend. There will be no replacing Ian because he was a completely unique, beautiful musician and human being. I'd like to say, of course, we're going to have a great jam session to remember Ian this afternoon. Well, that's kind of ironic because Ian didn't like jam sessions. <laughs> <laughs> so this one's on us. <laughs> Thank you, Tony Zuba. Uh, during that speech, I was just remembering uh, an incident when I was on tour with, with Terry and Ian, and uh, I'd organised some lessons with people. I was giving them, not taking them, incidentally. <laughs> and uh, three different saxophonists on this tour uh, uh, emailed me and asked for a lesson while I was up there. And uh, each one was more beautiful than the last. There were three ladies, and uh, of staggering beauty, the first one walked in and, and said, Oh, I've got to give my lesson now, Ian. He went, Oh, all right, okay. And, <laughs> Then the second day, another one turned up, and the third day, Ian said, teaching again, are we? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh... It says, in this world of materialism, I'm so, very unhappy, I'm so very happy and proud that my dear friend Ian never followed suit and always remained true to his passion. His clear vision and equanimity led him to become the beautiful man that we knew and loved. I've tried to dwell in the last few hours on 26 years of having had the pleasure of knowing Ian, but it's a human impossibility, and it will be an impossibility to, to, to express how much I miss my dearest friend that existed in this lifetime. I'm yearning to see you again, Ian. I'll always remember the last words you said to me a few weeks ago. I've had so much pleasure in my life, mate. It's okay, don't worry. For the moment, I miss you, love, Julie. Yeah. Okay, I'll just read this list. Uh, it's uh, Davide Mantovani from Gugano Bob, Sonia Richards, Soul Review Rubber Band, Paul Greenwood, saxophonist and doctor, that'd be Andy. Uh, <laughs> Matt Waits, I well, you know who he is, Andy Lafon, Paul Shanti Jayasinha, Jeff Simpkins, Raul D'Olivera, uh, Kiko Cowan, Sheena Roots, and these are hard names. <laughs> Uh, Edana Minghella, Domo and Megan, Patricia Gallagher, Sarah Gross, Sue and John Marsh, Nikki Meadows, Rachel Bundy and Dave Whitford. So uh, they send their condolences and sadness they can't be here.
I think it'd be a good time to play some music. I'd quite like to play on the first tune. Terry, would you like to play?
connection to Brazil, I think, is pretty strong. He has been there. He played in Baseado with Pedro for, I don't know how many years? 20? Uh, we've been together for 15 years. 
Thank you. Yeah, 15 years. Um, yes, yeah, so we have enjoyed very much Ian's uh, talent. If enjoy is the right word, or if it's enough. And uh, yeah, we didn't, with Ian, it was just everything flew, used to flow so easily. He could not know the tune, and we can just start playing. He just followed, he was just there. Yeah, we're gonna play a couple of tunes that remind me of him. I'll be 
we were totally wiped out by the amount of uh, Facebook posts we had, cards, phone calls, absolutely everything. And all of you who've come here this afternoon and showed your talents to us. Yeah. I do want to say from the bottom of my heart, and I know I speak for Claire and John and all the others, a very, very big thank you. Uh, Ian was the youngest of five children, and he really was subjected to classical music from his caricot, because I didn't believe in keeping everything very quiet in case it woke the baby up. Um, so he was subjected to classical music. Um, everything else fell into place. And as I said this morning, our house sometimes rocked <laughs> when he was starting to uh, get his little groups together. I said this morning, I use that word advisedly, groups, but you know what it's like when you start practicing and you don't really know how to play something, but you're trying. But we knew all about that. And um, like I said this morning, we had neighbours on one side who loved it when he started on the saxophone and one next door who hated it with a passion. But Ian never let that stop him and we didn't stop him. And when he decided he wanted to come to Brighton, he did so with our blessing. But like Alistair said earlier on, we had no idea of the extent of his talent because he kept it under his hat. He, he didn't boast or brag about anything to us. And I really did think he just did a bit of saxophone down here. And that was all. That was all we knew. But once again, I'd just like to say, I'm sure I speak for us all here, our family who are here this afternoon. Thank you all so much for your love that you've poured out to us. Thank you again.